Bauta. Welcome to our broadcast today. On behalf of Native Christians, my name is Pastor Dan Rautenberg. I'd like to welcome you to our broadcast. I pray as always that wherever you might be, uh, whenever you might be listening to this or or watching the broadcast, we ask God to bless his word and God to bless you. We're going to especially be asking God to, to bless you in your Christian walk, praying for, for that, especially in the next few weeks, because we're, we're launching an exciting new sermon series about what it means to follow Jesus. And this is a little bit uh, maybe different than the question most people would ask. Most people would ask maybe when you're talking about politics or your workplace or your organization, you might say, we need better leadership. How can we get better leadership? That's a hot topic these days. But in the church, we have the perfect leader. We have Jesus. Jesus who always leads us in the absolutely most perfect way, in the perfect direction, always for our good, always doing everything just exactly right and perfectly. We have a perfect leader. What we're asking for in the next few weeks is for Jesus to help us become better followers. How can we walk in the footsteps of Jesus? How can we follow him all the way to heaven in the best possible way? Because it's not just for us. We want to get to heaven, yes. But also by being followers of Jesus, we can also encourage others to come with us. And we want those rooms of heaven to be filled for eternity. So let's talk in the next few weeks about how to be followers of Jesus. And today we're going to, in our very first uh, message on this, we're going to get right to the heart, the heart of the matter, literally the heart. So if you have your Bibles at home, we're going to be opening up to the gospel for today, which is from Mark chapter 7. We're going to read some selected verses, verses 1 to 8, 14 and 15, and then 22 and tw to 23. If you have your Bibles again, uh, Mark chapter 7, and I encourage you to, to open those up. You'll want to read even more maybe when we're done. First, let's begin with a prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you so much for, for coming here for us, for doing things for us that we didn't deserve, for taking our place. We also thank you for coming into our hearts and sending your spirit to work in our hearts, for changing our hearts from hearts of stone to hearts that are open for you, ready to, to love you and to obey you and to do your will with joy and with, with wonder for the things that you have done. We thank you, Lord Jesus Christ, for changing our hearts, for motivating us, for inspiring us, for showing us the way to heaven and encouraging us to walk along that path. We ask you to bless us today and bless our families. We thank you for waking us up this morning and giving us a new opportunity to glorify you. Help us to use that opportunity to glorify you in all things. Jesus, in your name we pray. Amen. Brothers and sisters, again, if you're looking in your Bibles, Mark chapter 7. I'm going to read those selected verses for you. We'll begin at verse 1. The Pharisees and some of the teachers of the law who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus and saw that some of his disciples were eating food with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. The Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing, holding to the tradition of the elders when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And they observe many other traditions, such as the washing of cups, pitchers, and kettles. So the Pharisees and teachers of the law asked Jesus, Why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders, instead of eating their food with defiled hands? Jesus replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. As it is written, these people honor me with their lips but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. You've let go of the commands of God and are holding on to human traditions. Again, Jesus called the crowd to him and said, Listen to me, everyone, and understand this. 
Nothing outside a person can defile them by going into them. Rather, it is what comes out of a person that defiles him. For it is from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come. Sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these evils come from inside and defile a person. These are the words of our God. Friends in Christ, as we take a look at this, this text for today and take a look at the message that, that Jesus is, is telling to us, uh, understand it in its context first. So I need you to understand that by the time this conversation takes place, the Pharisees and teachers of the law had done this many times before. At least five times before in Scripture, we're told about these, these occasions or incidents where they come at Jesus with a complaint. Give you some examples. Jesus healed a paralyzed man, told him, your sins are forgiven, told him to take his mat and get up and walk. Instead of be amazed that Jesus is doing this, instead of being amazed by the miracle that happened right in front of him, you know what the Pharisees and teachers of the law focused on? Who are you? Who do you think you are? You say you can forgive sins. He's committing blasphemy, breaking the law of blasphemy. Or another occasion, Jesus was sitting down to eat dinner at the home of a former tax collector, Matthew, also called Levi. And, and this former tax collector, Matthew, was leaving his dishonest life because being a tax collector was a bad, bad profession, a very dishonest, traitorous profession. And here he is, leaving it behind, completely leaving it behind. And not only that, he's inviting all of his friends to come and listen to Jesus have their lives changed like he did. And instead of marveling at this life change, you know what the Pharisees and teachers of the law were doing? Grumbling. Who does Jesus think he is eating at the house of tax collectors and sinners? Then they were at it again. First, they accused Jesus' disciples of not fasting enough. In other words, abstaining from eating. And then when they do eat, and they're snacking on some heads of grain. They accuse them of working on the Sabbath. <laughs> Just can't win, can they? Even another example, when Jesus drove out demons, instead of being amazed that Jesus is driving out demons, they're grumbling again. Oh, he probably used Satan's power to drive out those demons. They were always complaining, always finding a way to pick, pick, pick away at Jesus, always accusing him of not keeping some rule or some law that oftentimes they themselves made up. And they did love making up those extra laws, extra rules. In addition to the commands that Jesus gave his people, you know that they made up 613 other ones? That's right. Pharisees and teachers of the law made up 613 other commands <laughs> and said that you had to keep those too or you're sinning. And not only that, oh, they went farther than that. They wrote 63 little booklets explaining all the finer details of all those new laws that they had just made up. And if you didn't obey those, you too were sinning against God. So guess what the Pharisees and teachers of the law were getting after Jesus and his disciples now about this time? Well, let's look at the text. Pharisees and some of the teachers of the law who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus and saw some of his disciples eating food with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. They're coming after Jesus and his disciples for not washing their hands. And friends, this wasn't just about dirt. This wasn't just about dirt under the fingernails. No, these were laws that they had about ceremonial washing. In parentheses, in, in the text, 
in Mark, it says the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing, holding to the traditions of the elders. And they come from the marketplace, they don't eat unless they wash, and they observe many other traditions, such as washing of cups, pitchers, and kettles. Now they're accusing Jesus and his disciples of breaking their laws, or not even laws, not from God, but traditions breaking the traditions of the elders, the rules that we invented. Why aren't your disciples living by those rules? Now, we could spend a whole other sermon just talking about the supposed violation of ceremonial law. <laughs> that's what they were accusing Jesus and his disciples of doing again. But that's not really the point, and we don't have that much time. They were accused of not following the man-made traditions of the elders. Like I said, they're always picking, picking, picking at Jesus, ignoring the obvious, and trying to find a way to accuse him of doing something wrong. Jesus doesn't get involved in this silly argument. He goes right to the heart of the problem. Jesus replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites, as it is written. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are but human rules. You have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to human traditions. Jesus gets right to the heart of the problem, and that's an intended pun, because the heart is the problem here. We can understand why Jesus called them hypocrites. They were fake. They were pretenders. They pretended to love and worship God, but God was standing right in front of them. Jesus is the Messiah. He wasn't shy about saying that, and the evidence should have proven that. They pretended to love and worship God, but when God was standing right in front of him, they hated him. And their hatred blinded them to the truth. This should have been pretty easy for them. They were supposed to be the experts on the prophecies and the promises of God. And this was the biggest one that they had been waiting for their whole lives, that their ancestors had been waiting for all their lives, for God to send a Messiah, a Savior, someone who would save them. And they would recognize him when he comes because he'd be doing things, doing miracles that no one else could do, preaching and explaining scripture in a way that no one had ever done so before. He would fulfill all the prophecies. He would keep all the promises. And here was Jesus doing this. He's healing the paralyzed man. He's driving out demons. He's preaching like no other preacher had preached before, explaining scripture to people. All the promises were coming true. All the prophecies were coming true right in front of their very eyes. And all they could do was hate him. Accusing him of breaking all of the traditions and rules that they had made up. Man-made laws. Man-made traditions. All they could do was scheme about how they were going to get rid of him, kill him. Why did they hate him so much? Well, here's a big reason. They were proud. And Jesus was hurting their pride. See, the Pharisees taught that people were basically good. They had good hearts. So all they had to do was just keep doing good things. Keeping all these laws. Showing God that they were obedient. Showing God that they were doing all kinds of good things. And if they did all these good things, if they did everything the right way, then God would owe them. God would owe them blessing. God would have no choice but to see how wonderful and good they were. And he would have to reward them. And they were doubly proud of themselves. Because with all these extra laws that they were making, they were going above and beyond. Doing so much better than anyone else around them. Doing so many more good things. 
They had gotten so proud. They had gotten so far away from God that they were ignoring the obvious. The fact standing right in front of them, all the prophecies, all the centuries of God telling them that they needed a Messiah and he would send one. And here he is standing in front of them. They needed a savior to save them from their sins. And they said, no, thanks. We're going to save ourselves because we are pretty good. And we keep all these laws. We're going to get into heaven our way, doing things our way. We don't want to hear this Jesus. And here was Jesus dragging him down, talking about sins, talking about the ways that they had sinned against God, talking about the fact that no matter how many good things they did, it wouldn't erase the bad things that they had done. They didn't want to hear that because Jesus wasn't just pointing out the sins of everyone else. He was pointing out their sins, telling them you aren't better than everybody else. You're the same as everyone else. You've sinned like everyone else. You cannot save yourselves. You're helpless to please God. You need a savior. All of the other things that they were doing were worthless. Their acts of worship, their keeping of the laws that they made up, their worship was worthless because they weren't loving Jesus and they weren't worshiping him as their savior. They didn't want him. They didn't need him. Their worship was not being humble before God. It was bragging to God. See how good we are. See how you have to bless us because we're doing all these things for you. You owe us. As Jesus rightly said, your worship is all lip service. They're empty words, empty actions, but your heart's are far away from God. See, we have to understand the heart is the problem. And then we'll understand why we need a Savior, why we need Jesus. Jesus points it out to them. He said the heart is the problem. Again, Jesus called the crowd to them and said, Listen to me, everyone, and understand this. Nothing outside a person can defile them by going into them. Rather, it is what comes out of a person that defiles them. For it is from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come. Sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these evils come from inside and defile a person. The problem is inside. The problem is in the heart. We can't blame anybody else for the sin that's in our own hearts. It's not our tragic backstory, not the evil that's been done to us by others. Can't blame anyone else. When there's evil that starts right inside of our own hearts, and that's why no outward ceremonies or a million good works will ever fix our problem. None of those things can erase the sin that's in our hearts. None of those things can take away the sin that's in our hearts. They can't erase the sins that have spilled out of our hearts into our thoughts and our words and our actions. That's why we need someone who can cleanse our hearts. Forgive us for the disgusting and violent and selfish and ugly things that live there. And only Jesus can do that. Only Jesus can fix us from the inside out. We need Jesus. We need a Savior. We cannot save ourselves. When we look at this story, it's not just the Pharisees who needed a Savior. In fact, the thinking of the Pharisees is alive and well among us. The problem is exactly the same. 
many people in our world today, like the Pharisees, are trusting in man-made ceremonies or rituals or sacred objects for blessing. Think those things are going to bless them and impress God, but they don't want Jesus. They actually think that those objects and those ceremonies will make them be blessed, and it can never be, friends. It can never be. Those rituals and ceremonies not commanded by God, not wanted by God. The sacred objects that God never wear, never anywhere gives power to bless will not bless. You can't worship without Jesus. You can't be blessed without Jesus. Anyone who tries to approach God without trusting in Jesus alone as their Savior doesn't earn God's blessing, only his anger. You've rejected his Son, the one who did everything to save us. You've rejected the Messiah, the only one that can save us. We can't approach God on our own terms, in our own way. It has to be through Jesus. Even some who call themselves Christians, though, can even fall into this thinking of the Pharisees. The Pharisees thought that they were believers in the true God, too. People have that same attitude today. If I pray, and if I go to church, and if I give an offering, and if I do something extra for God, if I go the extra mile and, and do these extra things for God, then God must reward me. God must bless me. They actually think that they're doing God a favor by worshiping him. You're not doing God a favor by praying to him, by going to church, by giving an offering, by doing something for the Lord. He doesn't owe us. Sometimes we fall into those traps. We think if I do something for you, God, then you must do something back for me. If I give you an offering, you got to bless me back 10 times, right? If I go to church, God, you got to do these things. You got to bless me and my family and take me to heaven. That's the thinking of the Pharisees. It's the same wrong attitude. We have to put away our pride. We're not obeying God so that he gives us something. We're not serving God so that he rewards us as if he owes us anything. We go to him instead in humility, in repentance. Jesus, I'm helpless without you. Jesus, I can't save myself. I can't do enough good things to erase the bad things. I can't clean myself from the inside out has to be you, Jesus. Only you can get my heart right. Save me. Put our trust in Jesus alone. We are beggars in front of him. Friends, we approach God in worship with that humility. Because when our hearts are right, then our worship will be right too. We still want to, as Christians, live a Christian life. We still want to obey God and keep his commands. We still want to serve him. We still want to worship. We want to give offerings. We want to, to do something to spread the gospel, to share the good news, to help a ministry. It's not because we're expecting something from God in return. Not because he's going to owe us if we're so good or better than somebody else. We're doing those things because Jesus Christ has cleansed our heart. It changes everything about your Christian life. No longer is it, I have to do something so I get heaven. I have to do something so I avoid hell. It's, I get to do something. 
I get to serve the Lord who saved me, Jesus Christ, saved by life. He owed me nothing, but he did it anyway. He came here for me. He forgave my sins. He cleansed my heart. I want to serve him. Friends, that's what being a Christian is about. It's about wanting to follow Jesus. Wanting to thank him for the wonderful things that he has done. Wanting to worship him because he deserves it, because he has done so many awesome things for us. When our heart is right, friends, we're not using God. We're loving him. No one can make you do that. Just like no one can make you become a Christian. You know what does that? The love of Jesus. The love of Jesus is what changes that heart. The love of Jesus is what motivates and inspires us to be followers of our leader, Jesus Christ. So my prayer today is that you see the love that Jesus has for you. See that he didn't owe you anything but came for you anyway. See that he loved you and he loved me when we did not deserve it, when we were covered in sins. See how he took those sins and paid for them all on the cross. See how he's better, better than anyone you've ever met, better than anything you've ever heard. The stories about Jesus are true. He's done these things for you. See how he loves you. See the beauty of Jesus and what he has done for you and how he saved you and how he wants you to have everything in eternity. That's what changes your heart. I don't have to follow Jesus. I want to follow Jesus. I'm not impressing God with my goodness. I'm just doing my best to thank him and glorify him for everything that he has done. I'm not worshiping Jesus to get something. I'm worshiping Jesus freely because he's given me everything. Jesus makes our hearts right. And that's what puts the joy into Christianity. We follow him with joy all the way to heaven. Brothers and sisters in Christ, that's my prayer for you, that you see the love of Jesus that is better than anything you've ever seen or heard of before. And that that joy is what drives you every day to wake up in the morning to follow Jesus. Here, God bless you. Amen.